Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, today, we're presenting the Mercedes-Benz AMG EQE SUV. All right. So um, this one is about $124,000. I think it starts at 109 or so. So a very expensive vehicle, AMG. And it's supposed to be fully fledged AMG, not an AMG line. Um, this is on the AVA, that is Electric Vehicle Architecture Platform of Mercedes-Benz that is shared with also the EQE sedan, EQS sedan, and both those SUV versions of those cars, right? So that architecture is supposed to give uh, Mercedes a lot of adjustability and length and width. And if we look around, we see that um, that idea of being adjustable translates to a lot of these decisions in terms of how beefy the suspension is to protect for being able to use some very heavy vehicles, uh, some brackets that adjust being able to use different wheel and rotor brake package diameters. Um, so, but let's just start in the front here. Uh, it's tough to see, but this vehicle doesn't really have a lot of sorb countermeasures. All right, so uh, we had this off earlier and took a peek in between you know, in this front 25% of the vehicle structure. There's um, a larger uh, stamped um, steel bumper that is relatively beefy. So that goes a little bit in the direction of protecting for sort, but there's no precise you know, tusk or anything like that that you see on higher volume vehicles, right? So, but yet again, on lower volume vehicles like this, that's something you see more often. If you look at the suspension here, right, virtual ball as standard on this price class of uh, vehicles, uh, everything forged aluminum, tension link, your, your uh, lateral link, the upper control arm, uh, a knuckle. And uh, so if we look at this, this is quite interesting, right? Almost everyone uses a conventional nut on your ball joints here. Um, this is quite interesting. It looks more compact. And uh, so the interface of this nut is actually inside of the knuckle, right? So this, I presume, gives you a lot better packaging, right? So if, if you look, there wouldn't be enough thread engagement in just this portion of the nut. So it extends into the knuckle for the given thread engagement. So the whole nut sinks into this giving you a very compact design in this area. These are the 21 inch wheels, but if you imagine if you had an 18 on there on the lower trim levels, you're really going to get close to a conventional nut. Not sure that's what, it, what they do on it, but that would be my guess. It's all packaging driven. Um, if you take a look here, $5,000 option. These are carbon ceramic brakes just in the front. A little secret for you, they're not $5,000 in manufacture, but that's what you have to pay. Um, 21 inch wheels, a little bit of air design. AMG usually does a very, I personally really love the design on AMG wheels, which if we start talking about wheel, uh, uh, design and aesthetics, this is the one time where I would tell you that the SUV version of a vehicle looks better than the, uh, the sedan. And I think sedans, just usually have better proportions, just naturally. But the EQE, I think there's a reason why you don't see a lot of them on the roads. Um, they look a little challenged, right? So this one looks a little bit better, kind of generic, but um, if, we, if you follow me down here, continuing our underbody review, um, we see an underbody cover of the already flat uh, battery tray, right? So a lot of vehicles, if you look at Tesla's or I believe even Lucid, they'll just have the aluminum or steel tray um, for, you know, you already have great aerodynamics, but on this AMG, they're looking for an additional NVH uh, reduction from underbody noise. And then if you come in the back, so it's to have these interesting uh, subframes. Let's take a look if you can see the subframe here. Yeah. So the front sub, sub, subframe is steel. We often see that um, for crash reasons. It's a little bit easier to design 
uh, a front subframe out of steel because you have more elongation in the material. You can play um, more, you know, with um, bringing or, or crushing up material and maneuvering uh, different components out of the way in the crash. It's more, um, let's say, predictable. You, you get to play with more levers to uh, design a crash strategy on steel. On the rear, often, especially on these German cars, you see um, cast aluminum and extruded subframes. And so if we think back to that this platform is supposed to be highly adjustable, you see you have these cast nodes, right, with their sand cast, with cores, uh, left and right, they're mirrored, different parts but mirrored. And then with these extrusions, the really deep extrusions, that connect them cross car, right? And now, if you wanted to build a wider car, all you'd have to do with no change in tooling is cut this extrusion a little bit uh, longer and you adjusted it for almost no cost, right? It's just different fixturing. It's all you really got to do. You know, and and um, so then the length of this platform is, is adjustable as well, just through stretching the body in white. In the body in white, it's tough to see here. There's some castings, there's front uh, cast shock towers. Uh, and in the rear, you have um, a rail. It's really tough to see, but you see a casting here. And then on the inside of the vehicle, if you look in the body in white, there'll be another casting that uh, when these combine together, create a closed section for the rear section of the rails in the body in white. So there's some casting going on there. They're quite sizable, nothing like a giga casting, but it's, you get a little bit of these giga casting savings where you integrate a lot of components uh, in the shock tower areas, front and rear. That's where you'd have usually a lot of little pieces. And by using castings, you get to make it all one. And with the casting, you also bring in that local stiffness for your suspension and damper mounts that, that you need. And usually that's you know, a little bit more difficult to engineer into a stamped structure. Uh, on the rear, multi-link, a lot of cover uh, um, air shields on this. If you look at this, that, and really another theme of the vehicle is aerodynamic uh, optimization, right? So you have shields everywhere. Um, the EQE, I think, so the sedan version of this has one of the lowest CD um, generally in the industry. I think it's 0.2. This is, of course, a little bit less aerodynamic because it's um, an SUV and has more frontal area. But if we look, there's a lot of detail that Mercedes has engineered into the aerodynamic and aero-related NVH design of this, right? So a lot of these leading edges um, are um, designed to break up vortices and reduce wind noise, right? You see all these little aerodynamic features here, wheel spats to reduce the pressure on the wheels, front and rear. And then if you come back to the front, you see these uh, teeth, same thing here, right? So you have your aero spat, giving you efficiency, but some teeth integrated to just reduce that wind noise that you would get from here, right? So reducing noise, increasing aerodynamics, again here, reducing underbody noise with this PET underbody shield. Uh, this is essentially what you see on your um, mirrors, right? So if you look at your vehicle, a lot of these have little teeth molded onto the top of the OVRM or side view mirrors, again, for, for uh, noise reduction. So this high performance version, of course, is dual motor, which gives you all wheel drive. Mercedes calls it formatic, as they did uh, with their internal combustion vehicles back in the day. Um, but this also comes in rear wheel drive only, right? So only one single motor in the back. So you, it would look just like this. I believe it's still the same motor, and so the same EDU. Um, unit in the rear, and then I just add a higher performance um, motor to the front, right? And that gives you 
I think 617 horsepower, 617 horsepower in standard mode, 701 foot-pounds of torque. And I believe, doesn't say here, but I believe there's a dynamic plus feature that uh, gives you close to 700 horsepower. So we will try that in our drive review, see how that launches. Should be pretty good. However, uh, this vehicle also weighs almost 6,000 pounds. So we complained about the weight and heft of the BMW i5. This is even heavier than that, right? So just uh, to com as a comparison, F-150 is considerably lighter, uh, oftentimes under 5,000 pounds. Right? So this is, this is F-150 plus in terms of weight. So here in the rear, we see a lot of technology. Um, we have rear steer from ZF. Uh, this rear steering system is, I believe, up to nine degrees of steering input. Um, so that's comparable to Cybertruck. That's about as high, nine, 10 degrees, as you see on rear wheel steering vehicles right now. With a shorter wheelbase in Cybertruck, this should really turn around um, on with you know, quite a low turning circle. Um, another feature right here is an active anti-roll bar. Right? So you have this sizable bar in the back and an electric motor that connects both of these, uh, both of the um, wheels through the ARB. Right? So now through that, the engineers are able to actively shift um, mass from one side of the vehicle to the other in order to um, augment the weight distribution or weight shift on the corner, right? So if you're in the dynamic mode, dynamic plus, I suppose for, uh, it's called here, uh, you're able to stiffen it up, keep the ride very flat. And then if you're just driving around, uh, going to work, you can essentially decouple um, this anti-roll bar so that you have more ride comfort. You, let's say you hit a pothole on one side, that shock won't be translated into the other side of the vehicle. And you're able to just let the suspension um, move as much as possible to accommodate um, whatever you're driving over. Um, we also see um, forged spring links here in the rear. Uh, again, aluminum knuckle, uh, air suspension right, to, the, <clears throat> to the subframe from the spring link, a damper up top, and uh, regular steel brakes in the rear, right? So with a ceramic, um, a carbon ceramic uh, brake option, you only get that in the front. So one interesting thing to point out here from a packaging perspective is um, this component right here. This seems to be part of the high voltage charging system. There's a little bit more packaged back here, which <clears throat> usually you see um, packaged through the inboard in the vehicle, right? So it's quite interesting especially um, due to the fact that this vehicle cannot open the front hood. It doesn't have a trunk. Um, there's probably a lot of stuff packaged in the front underneath, you know, underneath the bonnet. So they're not able to give you a trunk, but then also have interesting packaging in the rear here, right? And this is supposed to be a, a ground up electric vehicle architecture and usually when uh, evs are designed like that you get a lot of if packaging efficiencies compared to a gasoline car right so you get the trunk you get uh, a, you know a, a more flat uh, underbody and you know um, more space for the occupants if you take a look at lucid it's um you know, highly packaged vehicle, ground up. And compared to this, you see, you know, it's, I don't wanna say that they're, these are afterthoughts, but the way that a lot of these high voltage components are packaged away, they're just using the trunk, right? It's kind of a easy way to just throw stuff because you now you have the space 
because you don't have a large um, V8 in this case of an AMG in here, um, or um, like here in the rear of the bumper. Obviously, in a crash situation with all of these, you know, um, high voltage lines, um, interesting how they get around, um, you know, not exposing or severing these. Um, it's a consideration. I'm sure they worked it out, but you don't usually see these, you know, packaged back here. And then also, you know, that drives them to use quite a uh, sizable bracket. With that, uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, this was the Mercedes-Benz EQE AMG SUV. Thank you. Have a nice day.